Hi guys, and welcome to Stranger Than Fiction. Today I want to start a video series about quantum mechanics. Most of you have probably heard of it, and maybe you know about a couple of ideas that come from quantum mechanics like Schrodinger's cat, or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In these videos, I'm going to try to give you the background on where all that stuff comes from. The first step toward quantum mechanics came because people like stars, and if you like looking at stars, one of the things you notice is that stars don't all look the same. They can have really different colors, for example. A really easy example, if you live in the northern hemisphere, is Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant. It's so big and so close, relatively speaking, we've even taken some decent photos of it. Well, decent for something that's 640 light years away. Betelgeuse is the left shoulder of Orion, and you can tell it's reddish-orange even with your naked eyes. Meanwhile, the right foot of Orion is Rigel, and that one's a blue star. For a long time, people thought that the color of a star might tell you something about its temperature, just like a hot piece of metal goes from glowing red to yellow as it heats up. So a yellow star would be hotter than a red one, and a blue star would be even hotter than that. And the reason you'd care about that is that the temperature of a star can tell you about how old the star is, and sometimes how large it is. So, for instance, the stars near the center of this galaxy are bluer, which means they're hotter and probably younger than the stars out here, which are redder. Toward the end of the 1800s, telescopes had gotten good enough to allow us to measure the colors of individual stars pretty accurately. Astronomers were pretty happy about this, because it meant that we could learn a lot more about how stars form and how they age. So the first thing to do was to figure out the exact connection between a star's color and its temperature. Nobody was really sure what a star was like inside, but they thought a good model might be one developed by a German fellow named Gustav Kirchhoff in 1859. He suggested, picture an object that can absorb any wavelength of light, but that doesn't reflect light at all. Well, anything that absorbs all light would look black, so they call this imaginary object a black body. All one word, because it looks more sciencey that way. But it's not just a black colored object like this, or like this, because a black body also doesn't reflect light. So it's not just black, it's a flat black. This pile of carbon is more like it, but even that stuff reflects a little light. Anyway, even though a black body doesn't reflect light, that doesn't mean it gives off no light at all. Instead, it glows, depending on its temperature. Different colors of light have different energies, so as something gets hotter, it gives off light with a higher energy. If something's really hot, like a star, it might glow red, like Betelgeuse. And if it's even hotter, it'll glow blue like Rigel. Even you, your body, obeys this rule. Your body's warm, so you give off light. But since you're not as warm as a star, the light that you give off has way less energy, and it's down here in the infrared part of the spectrum. That light you're giving off is what people see when they look at you using infrared glasses. So a black body is a great model, but it still doesn't give us a way to tell the exact temperature from the color of the star. To get that, you have to use some math. I'm going to leave out the mathematics here, but I've made some other videos where I do explain it, and I'll link to those in a minute. If you really want to understand quantum mechanics and use it to make discoveries of your own, I hope that you'll watch them and get a feel for the math behind the science. I promise I've made it as easy to understand as I can, even if you don't do math very often. So, using the science they knew about at the time, a guy named John Strutt, better known as Lord Rayleigh, came up with an equation that connected the color and the temperature of an object. By the way, for years, I got this guy, Lord Rayleigh, confused with Sir Walter Raleigh, especially since Sir Walter also made some scientific studies. They're not the same guy, although they were both members of the Mustaches for Science Club, along with Kirchhoff, who I mentioned earlier. Anyway, Lord Rayleigh came up with this equation. It says that in a particular volume, light that has a frequency nu, that's this symbol over here, which looks like a V, it's actually a Greek letter nu, light with a frequency nu will contribute this amount of energy. These numbers over here are all constants. They never change, so the only variables here are the frequency and the temperature. So think about what this equation's telling you. The higher the temperature, the higher the energy is going to be. That makes sense. Also, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. That also makes sense, because we already knew that light has more energy the higher the frequency is. That's why x-rays up here, where the frequency is really high, have way more energy than visible light over here. There's only one problem with this equation, which is that it's very, very completely wrong. 
And in a way, you can tell what's wrong with it when you really look at it. According to this, the energy should increase as the frequency gets higher and higher. But that means any black body will give off more energy as visible light than as infrared light. And it'll give off even more as ultraviolet light, and even more than that as x-rays, and so on. As you get higher and higher in frequency, you get more and more energy. So every star should be giving off tons of x-rays and ultraviolet light, much more than visible light, and that's just not the way things are. In fact, according to this equation, you should be giving off x-rays and UV light instead of peeking out in the infrared as your body actually does. This was considered to be such a bad result that it got its own name, the ultraviolet, ultraviolet catastrophe. catastrophe. And it was the first hint we had that there was something missing in our understanding of physics in the late 1800s. The man who sorted it out was Max Planck, another guy with a mustache of reason. His breakthrough was to suppose that the light given off by the black body came from tiny, tiny oscillating objects like little springs, but that these springs couldn't have just any old energy. The energy had to come in little pieces, and it's not possible for these springs to have an energy that's less than one of those pieces of energy. Today we know that there aren't little springs making up a black body. It's electrons that give off the light, but they didn't know about electrons then. But Planck was right that electrons can only have certain energies and not just any amount. When he used this idea, he got an equation that connected the color of a black body to its temperature, just like Rayleigh's equation did. But Planck's equation looks much different. Planck's is more complicated. It has a term with an exponent down here, for one thing. But just like Rayleigh's equation, this one has lots of constants in it. All these symbols are numbers that never change. So just like the Rayleigh equation, there's really only two variables, the temperature and the frequency of the light that's given off, just like for the Rayleigh equation. This time, because of this term with the exponent, it's not really easy to tell what's going to happen to the energy when you change the color or change the temperature. But if you plot it out, here's what you get. This graph has frequency down here, and the height is energy. This is for a black body at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, this is the spectrum of light that your body's giving off right now. Planck's equation shows that your body gives out a pretty small amount of light at really low frequencies out here, then it maxes out here at around 20 terahertz, and then it drops off again. The important thing here is that this entire graph only spans the infrared region. Lower frequencies like microwaves are crammed all the way down here at the edge, and higher frequencies like visible light are way off the scale. They're all the way to the right past the edge of the graph. The Planck equation works really well for stars, too, which was the whole point to begin with. If you plot out the spectrum of the sun, for example, you find out that it matches up with the plot you get from the Planck equation at 9940 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see that the curve is pretty high in the red and yellow regions, as well as in the infrared, and that's just the way our sun is. Meanwhile, Rigel's spectrum matches up with a plot of the Planck equation at a temperature of 19,300 degrees Fahrenheit. It's way hotter than the sun, as you might expect. And the curve shows that Rigel is blue colored. You'll also notice that Rigel's curve is way higher than the sun's. That's because Rigel's much brighter, as you might expect, because it's also hotter. Planck's equation predicts that, too. In fact, this graph actually shows three plots. It shows the one for Rigel, it shows the one for the Sun, and it shows one for the human body, which I showed you earlier. It's way down here in blue. It looks like a flat line here because the peak is so much smaller than the one for the Sun. That makes sense since you're not as hot as the Sun is, and you don't glow as brightly as the Sun does. So, the important thing to take away from all this is that in order to fix the black body equation, Planck had to do something that had never been tried before. He had to assume that matter couldn't have just any amount of energy. Instead, the energy has to come in tiny amounts and not any smaller. He called those tiny amounts of energy quanta. And in the century since then, we've been studying the implications of that. That field of study is called quantum mechanics. So, now that you know how quantum mechanics got its start, I hope you'll want to know more about it and what you can do with it. 
so I hope you'll join me for more videos. Also, I hope you'll give the videos with a more math-based explanation a try. I mentioned those a little earlier. I've got a short one explaining where the Raleigh equation came from, and another short one for the Planck equation. See you next time!